us. Today we're looking at the Psalms, continuing our, our uh, journey through the Psalms. It's amazing that we finally have gotten to Psalm 140. We only have, you know, from here to 150, and we're going to be through. So at the rate we're going, you know, by next year, we'll be through. But today we're going to look at Psalms 140 through 142. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 140, and I'll read the Psalm to you. And then, uh, as is what we've been doing through the Psalms, we'll take some time to look at sections of it, individual verses, and go through these Psalms together one at a time. Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 140, Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purpose to, to make my steps stumble. The proud have hidden a snare for me in cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. Selah. I said to the Lord, You are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Selah. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Now, as we begin, let me begin with a correction from last week. Last week I was sharing with you, and uh, I had mentioned as we had begun our, our study of the Psalms that uh, I had given to you the wrong the wrong uh, cross-reference. And for those of you who took notes last week, it was in Psalm 137. I had said to you it was Deuteronomy 27, uh, verses 15 and uh, 36. Actually, it was Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 and 36. Now, for some, it doesn't really matter. For others, you've been waiting with stones to kill me for that. And so, allow me to correct that. Now, as we get into our study today, Psalm 140, I'm going to attempt to do as much as I can with as many errors as is possible. But anyway, as we look at this, beginning at verse 1 and taking verses 1 through 3, what this is, is this is a psalm of David. And obviously, as we went through this particular psalm, it's a psalm where uh, David, the psalmist, is calling upon God for deliverance from evil men. Obviously, he's been falsely accused by the evil ones, and, and he calls on the Lord uh, for, for help from the Lord, and that's what we're looking at. Now, obviously, that's the best thing to do. I mean, when you're being uh, opposed and we're, when you're being attacked, the wisest thing for us to, to ever do is to call on the Lord and to do so immediately. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that God is our present help and is willing to help us if we call out to Him. Uh, how do we know that? Well, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, for example, in Isaiah 41, verse 13, uh, God said, I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. That's a promise from the Lord. Psalm 121, verse 2, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so the wisest thing that we can do, obviously, as believers, is call on the Lord in our time of, of, of need, and, and He will answer us. And that's what we see here in Psalm 140. Notice in verse 1 how he prays, Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men. So when he speaks about delivering and preserving, uh, deliver obviously speaks of rescuing, and preserving speaks of watching over or guarding me. So rescue and guard me, he's saying, from violent men who are scheming to destroy me. These are, these are men described as being evil men, and they're evil men because he says they're violent in their actions and they destroy with their speech. All of these evil things are obviously products of evil hearts. That's what he says here when he says in verse 2, they plan evil things in their hearts. Evil is springing out, in other words, from their unregenerate nature. Now, one of the things that really isn't flattering, but when you begin to study the Bible, you discover what the Bible says concerning human nature is that we who have, um, we who are just, you know, we're born as we're born, we are born with a sin nature. There are quite a number of people who want to argue against that. 
They want to argue and say that, no, we aren't born evil. We basically are born like a, uh, a blank tablet and all, and, and our, our experiences basically are written on that tablet and basically form us for, you know, to become what we eventually are. And that's just not true, though, though obviously environment and, and all does have an awful lot to do with, with uh, the way we end up. We end up uh, in a certain way because we have a nature, and the nature that we have, according to Scripture, is fallen. It's a fallen nature, and, and that's the reason why we do the things that we do. That's the reason why we can be the way that we are. Uh, my grandson, Josiah, who is the most perfect child who's ever been born, I am certain, outside of Jesus himself. But Josiah has gotten into the habit of spitting on people, except for Grandpa. But he does spit on people, and, and he does hammer them, and he went into the... Uh, went into the uh, children's ministry for the first time this last Sunday, and I found out that my Josiah was pinching children in there. He's got a sin nature, obviously derived from his grandmother, but that's, that's, that's where it comes from, at least in my Bible, that's what it says. The Bible teaches us very clearly that we have a sin nature, and evil proceeds from us because that's the nature that we possess. Uh, Romans in chapter 3, verses 10 through 14 in the, in the New Testament, and gives us insight concerning that. The Apostle Paul writes, uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So evil proceeds from the unregenerate nature of man. And that's what uh, David is speaking about. That's what he's saying here when he's speaking concerning those who plan evil things in their hearts. In verse 4, he says, Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked, Preserve me from violent men who have purpose to make my steps stumble. So, continuing on, he makes it very clear that these enemies are intent on destroying him. And because that's true, he's crying out for the Lord uh, to give him some help. They're schemers. They're speaking against him. They're trying to stumble him, and they're trying to trap him. Uh, in Psalm 35, at verse 7, the psalmist said, "'Without cause they've hidden their net for me in a pit.'" which they have dug without cause for my life. And so he's crying out, saying that there's a snare that has been established for me so that they might entrap me. So in verse 6, I said to the Lord, You are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, uh, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. You've covered my head in the day of battle. So in spite of the evil that is planned against me, he's crying out and saying, God, I know that you will help me, and I know that you will hear my cry. I have a confidence, he's saying, that you listen, and I have a confidence that you will protect me because, and I want you to notice this, because I have a relationship with you. Notice verse 6, how he says it. He says, I said to the Lord, you are my God. That's a very important phrase here because he's not speaking about God simply being God. There are a lot of people today who have obviously in our society will say, yes, there is a God and all. He's not saying uh, you are a God. He's not saying I believe that there's such a, a thing as a supreme being or some kind of spirit that's above all things. He's saying you are my God, and there's a difference between saying you are God and you are my God. There are a lot of people who are religious, and they're able to say, oh, there is a God. I believe in a God. There's some kind of power in this universe. There's a, a higher power or whatever. There's an intelligence, a greater intelligence, and all of that. And we can call it God, or you can call it anything you like, but it's beyond humans. But that's not what David is saying here. David is saying, I have trust in you. I have a knowledge that you will deliver me, not because I simply believe that you exist, I know that you will deliver me because you are my God. That's how I know that you will deliver me. God hovers basically over David to protect him, and he knows that. And in spite of the fact that there are evil men who are plotting against me and setting traps for me, I know that I can ask for your help, and you will deliver me. And I know you will deliver me because you're my God. And that's what he's saying in verse 6. I said to the Lord, you're my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head 
in the day of battle. I have confidence in you because you listen, and I have confidence in you because you cover my head. That's another way of saying you protect me. Every military individual knows that that means you cover my head. It's a way of speaking about having your head covered by the Lord, but the same thing, we had to wear helmets and all that that were intended to protect our head, and that's what he's talking about. You protect me. The psalmist again in Psalm 31, verse 14 said, As for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. And so I trust you. In verse 8, do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Selah. As you know, the word selah speaks about meditating on this. Think about this for a moment. That's what selah speaks about. So he's saying, do not let evil succeed, because the one who is evil will think that you are on his side when his plans seem to have success. That's an interesting way to pray. They're certainly going to think that you have granted them their wishes, and that, David is saying, is evil. And therefore, Lord, I ask, don't grant them their desires. Verse 9, as, as for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire. Isn't he kind? Uh, into deep pits <laughs> that they rise not again. Uh, let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. And so he's saying, what they have devised for me, may it come upon them. What they want to do and intend to do to me, may it come upon them. May they suffer their own plans. May your judgment come upon them and bring evil to its rightful end. That reminds me of Psalm 28, 4, uh, where it says, Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back upon them what they deserve. And that's how he's praying there. In verse 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. So the Lord, he's saying, is a righteous judge. And as a righteous judge, he always does that which is right. And the result will be thankfulness on the part of those who love him. So he's trusting the Lord to do that which is right. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Psalm 141, another psalm of David, beginning at verse 1. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to, to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it, for still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff, and they hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave, as when one plows and breaks up the earth. But my eyes are upon you, O God the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape safely. It sounds like David went through a lot of hard times as I read the Psalms, and as, as we're looking at this, once again, he's crying out for help, and that's what we see in the first two verses of Psalm 141. Notice he says, I cry out to you, make haste to me, give ear to my voice when I cry out to you, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So David uh, is crying to God again, as you note here, to intervene and deliver him. He wants him to, to deliver him in two ways, and I want you to notice that. He wants God to deliver him internally and externally. He's asking God to do a work in his heart as well as safeguarding him. And, and I really believe that that's the wisest way to pray. God, work in my heart and protect me as I walk here on the face of the earth as a servant uh, uh, pleasing you. And so notice in verse 1 he says, I cry out to you, make haste to, give, uh, haste to me, give ear to my voice when I cry out. In other words, Lord, I need you, and I don't need you next week, and I don't need you next month. I need you right now. 
Lord, I have a cry right now that, that I'm, I'm bringing before you, and I'm asking you to please move quickly on my behalf. I guess every one of us in this room understands exactly what he's talking about. Every one of us who've ever prayed, who've ever found ourselves in a situation where immediate deliverance is necessary, any one of us and every one of us has cried out like this before. We said to the Lord, God, I need your help, and I'm asking you in verse 1 to make haste to me. Lord, I'm asking that you not delay for a moment. I'm asking that you would work right now. And so I'm asking that you'd give ear to my words and, and listen to my prayer. That reminds me of Psalm 5 where the psalmist in Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3 said, give, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King, my God. For to you I will pray, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Lord, I'm asking you right now to move on my behalf. I need your help, and I need it immediately. Notice in verse 2 how he says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Prayer and incense are linked in the Old Testament as well as the New. Incense was presented there in the temple and presented there in the tabernacle. Incense was, incense was presented on what was called the altar of incense. And when the altar of incense, when the incense was offered up and the incense rose as a sweet fragrance, ultimately prayer became linked to that. And so your prayers are in Scripture very often likened unto incense because it rises to heaven. And so he's speaking concerning the sacrifice of prayer. Not only that, when he speaks of the lifting up of his hands, the lifting up of your hands is, is an Old as well as a New Testament form of worship. You know, I know that some people get freaked out if they see somebody raising their hands to the Lord. And let's face it, um, you know, sometimes people have done things to draw attention to themselves. And I can understand why somebody might feel uncomfortable if somebody raises their hand and all. But uh, raising your, your, your hands to the Lord is a form of worship and praise as old as the Old Testament. And as they would raise their hands to the Lord, it was an offering of God. They're lifting up their holy hands unto Him. It's not only in the Old Testament. You find it in the New. If you take notes, this is correct. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Paul said, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When you're worshiping the Lord, it's an attitude of worship. You're, you're giving your purity of worship to God. That's a, it's a, it's a picture of your worship as well as a surrender. And that's what he's speaking about here. And he's saying to, to the Lord, my prayer should be like incense. In other words, it should rise up to heaven. It's an offering to you. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. It's a form of sacrifice, and I'm surrendering to you, Lord, as I yield myself to you. There are a lot of people that I've encountered over the years who have a, a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They have an outward appearance of religiosity, but there's a denial of true fellowship with God. And I see that quite often, I guess, just because I'm in the ministry. That's what I see. That's who I see. I, I see a lot of sincere worship. As a matter of fact, I'm always blessed because I see so much of it. But on occasion, I, I, I am around insincere worship. And insincere worship sometimes is simply a worship with the intent of drawing attention not to God, but to the person who's involved in worship. And... Uh, when, when a person wants to draw attention to themselves, well, obviously, the attention that is given to that person has been taken from the God that deserves that worship, and we ought to keep that in mind. You know, sometimes in our fellowship, we've had to approach people. It hasn't happened in many years, but, you know, we've come in to worship, and they're obviously visitors here, and they'll bring their musical instrument, a tambourine or whatever, and, you know, they may start banging away, and, you know, it's a little different, and before you know it, they're in the aisle, after a while, they're doing the Holy Ghost hoochie coo, and, and somebody's got to come up and say, you know, you've got to stop that, man. What are you doing? Um, well, you know, I'm just worshiping the Lord. No, basically what you're doing is drawing attention to yourself, and they don't like it, and we've had people upset over the years about that, you know, because we'll ask them, could you please, you know, go back into the seating area there, and, and you don't need to be dancing around. It's drawing attention to yourself. We had one person years ago get very angry at us as we asked them to please um, settled down a bit, and he got very angry, made a lot of noise, and stormed out. 
And, um, you know, to, to say that I was worshiping the Lord and you quenched the Spirit when you're making a scene like that is kind of ridiculous. It's quite obvious that you want to do something you want to do, and when you're told not to do that, you say, I'm worshiping God, but in reality, you're drawing attention to yourself. Now, when you have pure worship, there's no attention being drawn to you whatsoever. The worship goes to God. And so David is saying, listen, I am praying to you, Lord. Make haste to me. Give ear to the voice, what my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now it goes on in verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Evil comes in various ways. Uh, evil comes through our speech, evil proceeds from our heart, and evil can be worked uh, by our hands. And so the wise believer guards their heart lest they give in to evil. And he's praying here, and I want you to notice that. He's praying that God will protect him from evil in any form. Set a guard, o, o Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. It's a powerful prayer. It's a prayer that I can honestly say before you that I have prayed more than one time, God, help me to keep my mouth shut. Because there are times that I might say something I ought not to say, or I might say it in a way that shouldn't be said. You know, I, I used to say this quite often in this fellowship. I haven't done it for years now, but I, I used to say, you know, there are different offenses I can offend in different ways. The, there's the offense of the personality. Some people, let's face it, you know, are just offensive with their personality. They can do things that cause people to get upset simply because, well, because they're acting like jerks, because they're just being that way. You know, there's the offense of the personality, and then they say, I'm being persecuted for Jesus' sake. No, you're being persecuted because you're a jerk. You know, if you weren't a jerk, they wouldn't be mad at you. You know, you walk up to somebody and you say, are you a Christian? And they say no, and you say, well, you're going to hell unless you believe you're a jerk. You ought not to say that. So that's the offense of jerkiness. But there's another offense, and it's the offense of the cross. You know, if you're loving the person that you're speaking to and sharing from your heart the things that God has placed there and opening the Word and, and, and prayerfully treating them with respect, and they still get upset, that's the offense of the cross. They're offended at Jesus for Jesus' sake, you see. And so what I pray for, what we ought to pray for as believers is, is Lord, set a guard over our mouth. Help us not to just blurt things out and say things and, and offend people and hurt their feelings and all, and then say, I'm being, uh, you know, I'm being persecuted for Jesus' sake. And we have to be very careful about that. You know, uh, recently I've been asked by more than one person relating to my, um, what, do you, what do you see about, you know, the, the Pope, the new Pope? And I'm, I, I guess, you know, it's been on the, on the news uh, for, uh, quite a bit. And, and what I think about the Pope is I don't. That's my answer. I don't. Uh, that, that's not something that pertains to my spiritual life. That's not something that I'm concerned about. You know, the election of a new pope and everything like that may, may be something that affects a Catholic, and it certainly affects, you know, the world. But as for myself, I'm not that interested in that kind of thing because I wanted to pursue the one that matters, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, you see. That's who I want to pursue. And, and so that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So me, I have to set a guard over my mouth because I can say things that are extremely offensive and, and all, and I have to be careful not to do it right now. As a matter of fact, I'm moving in that direction, and I better reel it back. <laughs> so anyway, verse 4, do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. Lord, may I be careful who I hang around with. Because whoever it is that I find myself hanging around, fellowshipping with, I'm going to basically begin to be like them. So help me to be very selective with those whom I allow in my inner circle because their philosophy is going to ultimately help me to establish my way of life. The bottom line, all of us know this, is show me a man's friends, I will show you the man. Those whom we are most like are the ones that we normally call our best friends. And so he's just simply saying something that I think is very wise. He's saying, I don't want to practice wicked works with those who practice iniquity. Help me to have the wisdom to know that some people in my life are not benefiting me in my walk with Christ. Help me to understand that. 
that I don't gather around me people who will influence me to evil. Help me to have the wisdom to know that some people I can love with, with a great love, but their ministry, their people I pray for, their people that I care for, but they're people who don't know the Lord. So help me, Lord, to have an understanding that I can love them and care for them, but I don't want to be influenced and become like them. You need to do this. This is, a, this is something the Lord gave to me years ago that has proven to be a very, very, very powerful reality in my life. I began to realize that some acquaintances are friends and some are ministry. And when I began to realize that, some are friends. Well, what's the difference, you might say? Well, don't you minister to your friends? Absolutely. But I have discovered that my friends and I are facing the same direction with the same kind of heart, and we lift each other up as we walk towards the Lord. I've discovered that. I, I shared this with you uh, last week, how, how my friend Gary and I were in Israel, and I mentioned to you that this pillar fell on top of Gary and, and, and flattened him, and, uh, and I helped him to get up. I knelt down next to him. I prayed for him. I had a pulled hamstring. Now he's been flattened like a tortilla. And as he's laying there, you know, I kneel down next to him, and I put my hand on his head, and his head has an enormous uh, bump on it or where he has slammed his head on the, on the rocks. And, and he's just laying there, and I'm kneeling with him, and I'm praying for him. I help him to get up, and I, with a hamstring, and him just, just, just smashed by that three, 400-pound pole, we're walking very slowly together towards the bus, and, and that's a picture of, of my walk in the Lord. That's a picture to me. I need help, and I'm helping somebody who needs help. That's ministry. I need God's help, so I realize that without Him, I am crippled. But He gives me strength. As He gives me strength, I help somebody else who needs strength. That's friendship. That's how friendship works. But there are others out there who are just flat-out ministry. And so you love them, but you know that when you see them, you know they're going to have the latest dirty joke. You know they're going to tell you about some things you really don't need to know. That happens. They're going to want to go someplace that you don't want to go. And yet, you're thinking, I want to reach them for the Lord because I love them to pieces. They may even be a brother or a sister, your mom or your dad. It could be somebody very special to you. Marie, my wife and I, on occasion, especially when we first got married, I had a friend who was very dear to me, but he was not walking right with the Lord, and I still would maintain relationship with him. And so Marie and I would sit when we saw them, and before I went to see him, and it wasn't that often, but when, before I went to see him, I would take my wife by the hand, and I would pray with her, and I'd say, honey, we're going to enter into ministry right now because you know that he needs ministry. I loved him like a brother, very dear to me, but I knew that he had a pull in my life that could take me away, and I didn't want that. So be wise in your relationships. Be wise and know that there are some who influence you from good. And David is praying, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. Do not let me eat of their delicacies. When he speaks about, do not let me eat of their delicacies, do not uh, allow me to uh, indulge myself sensually with the things that they like to do. Now, verse 5 is interesting, how he says, let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me, and it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. What an interesting scripture. When he says, let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness. A righteous person is open to correction from those who love the Lord. A righteous person is open to correction. One of the ways that you can, you can test your own maturity, how do you feel when you're corrected by somebody? When they correct you, do you look at them and say, oh, bless the Lord, thank you so much, I truly appreciated that. Uh, you know, I really needed to know that, and now my life will be blessed by God. Or do you say, what are you talking about? Who do you think you are? Since when did the Holy Spirit retire and you took his place? <laughs> you can have attitudes like that, can't you? Of course you can. I know you can, because I do, you know. And, and that's what he's saying. He's basically saying, I want to have a heart that is correctable. 
Now, I want, a, I want to be correctable when a righteous man is correcting me. You see, sometimes the unrighteous might approach you and say, listen, you're going too far with your, your Christianity. You know, why don't you just bring it down a notch or two, you know? And that's an unrighteous person who's convicted. I've discovered a long time ago, and so have you, that, uh, that some people do not appreciate your walk with Jesus Christ, and they'll do what they can to, to, to stop it. They may even say, who made you a judge over me and get upset at you because you actually persist in sharing with them the love of Christ? You might have several friends, and, and, and one of them, as you're sharing, or you may not even be sharing anything. You're at work, you're sitting down, and you're eating, eating lunch with these people that you work with, and you consider these coworkers to be close enough to eat lunch with and all, and one of them just starts just jumping on you for no reason. And what did you do this weekend? Well, you know, I went to church, you know, and, oh, man, are you going to start doing that again, you know, shoving God down my throat? What's wrong with you? But you know this old saying, and it's true. If you throw a rock into a pack of dogs... The one that barks is the one that got hit. And very often, that person's under conviction, you know, and that's what it is. You know, they're under conviction. And so, they may be trying to tell you not to speak, but I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to that. But if a righteous person is saying, listen, you know what, I have to be honest with you, the way you're presenting yourself is it's a little obnoxious, a bit arrogant. You know, I might, I might feel in my heart, well, you know, what do you know? You know, but I have to tell you that I learned this, and I've been learning this for a long time. You know, especially at first, I would argue back. I'd say, well, I don't see you witnessing. You know, when you start witnessing, then you can talk to me. And they'll say, well, you know what? You know, I do witness, but I don't witness like you because you're an in-your-face kind of guy, and you're turning people away. And I'd say, well, what gives you the right? What do you mean I'm an in-your-face? Are you talking about me? I'm in your face. What are you talking about? I'm not in your face. And I was, and I would go home, <laughs> and the Lord would say, yeah, you are, <laughs> you're a jerk too. <laughs> oh, boy. Let the righteous correct you. If somebody loves the Lord and loves you and they bring a word of correction, value that. Because, you know, the, uh, the Bible makes it very clear, faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. When somebody loves you enough to tell you the truth because they, they do love you and they're righteous, well, even as, as David says, uh, may, may we see it as a kindness. Uh, he says, though, in, at the end of verse 5, for still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff. They, they hear my words for they are sweet. Our, our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave as when one plows and breaks up uh, the earth. You know, this is hard to understand, and I'm not going to pretend to have uh, a lot of knowledge of what he's saying there. When he says in verse uh, 6, their judges are overthrown, it seems that what he is doing here is he's praying that evil be overthrown. It would even seem, and it seems clear, that he's praying that ungodly leaders will die cruel deaths. And I guess there's a point to that because it would shock those who support them. Because you see in verse 6 when it says, and they hear my words for they are sweet, uh, the inference would be the, the followers hearing the words of David, seeing what has happened to, in verse 6, the judges or those leaders, and as they speak amongst themselves, they're saying our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave as when one plows and breaks up the earth. In other words, he's saying perhaps it will cause those who follow these cruel judges uh, to consider their end. In verse 8 through 10, closing that, uh, that psalm, but my eyes are upon you, O God the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape safely. So finally, he just closes by saying, Lord, I, I'm praying that you would protect me and protect me as you deal with them. May their evil plans come back upon them. And finally, Psalm 142. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. Look at my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. 
I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. Once again, David is crying out to the Lord, crying out, he says, with his voice. He's going through a tough time. Uh, verse 7 gives us some insight. It's, he says, bring my soul out of prison. It may be that he's speaking of a physical prison, but in reality, I think that he's speaking about being in bondage. We'll see that in just a moment. But in verses 1 and 2, once again, we see that David has an open heart before God and before man. And he doesn't hide the reality of his situation from either one. He speaks about his cry, his supplication, his complaint, and his trouble. When he speaks of his cry, he's crying out to God. When he speaks concerning supplication, he's asking God to give him favor. When he speaks concerning his complaint, he's speaking of anxiety that's in his heart. When he speaks of trouble, he's saying, I'm in distress. One of the things that as I was preparing this today and looking at it, that the Lord spoke to my heart, it's very simple. It's an easy phrase. Keep it real with the Lord. Be real before the Lord. There are a lot of people who aren't. There are a lot of people who even try to deceive the Lord by putting on pious exterior actions. And, and I, I have discovered a long time ago that the Lord sees my heart. He knows my intentions. He knows everything about me. I can't hide from Him. You know, I can come up here and I can put on a, a good, good cover. I can put on the pious face, you know, the religious look and everything. But God sees my heart, and I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. I know that God does that, and because I know that, I've asked the Lord for a long time, I've asked the Lord, make me real. I want to be a real person. I don't want to be anybody's cartoon character of a Christian. I want to be real before you. I want to be who I really am. And I think I'm speaking to a generation that understands that. I don't want to be phony, I say to the Lord. I want to be real. You know, so when we church, the church first began... I would sit down as I was teaching in a front room, and I, and I wouldn't wear shoes, and I wore a T-shirt, and I would just sit there with my feet crossed, and I did that for the first several Bible studies until my mom took me aside, and my mom said, you know, I didn't come to church to look at your feet. <laughs> so I had to start wearing shoes, you know, and I still like, I, you know, I don't know why I'm telling you this, you don't care, but... I still don't wear shoes. I wear shoes on Wednesdays and Sundays because <laughs> I just don't like them. But I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, can I be real, just a real person? Because as I look out there in the church world, I see guys who don't seem to be real. Not to say that they're not, Lord, but it's just not me. I see guys who, when they open up the Bible, suddenly stop speaking normal English, you know? And before you know it, it's all King James. And when they pray, it's just kind of odd and bizarre and weird, you know, oh, thou great and magnificent God, you know, what's that all about, you know? I think that is so odd, Lord. I mean, what happens to these people? I mean, did somebody teach them to be freaky or do they do that because they think it pleases you? And so for the longest time, you know, that's what I've asked the Lord to make, you know, to, to, to make me a real person. And I'm not speaking about the David show here. I think I'm speaking to you too. I think that you just, I'm certain that I have people here who are saying the same kind of thing. Lord, I just want to be real. I don't want to be a cookie cutter Christian, you know, so that people look at me and they can say by, by my hairstyle or, or how I'm dressed, you know. I mean, you can't imagine how many people freak out when they find out I'm a pastor. You can't imagine. I mean, I sit there with, with sweatshirts, you know, and, and, and sandals normally, and, and they're looking at me, and they're saying, you're a pastor? Yeah. You got, uh, you're a pastor? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got a few people going to your church? <laughs> no, I got a few. Yeah, there's a few showing up, yeah. <laughs> they, they can't believe it. They can't believe it. Like, thinking, but you, where's your suit? You know, I wear a suit. I wear a suit once in a while. I like suits. I just don't like, I, I think ties were invented by women to get back at husbands. I don't <laughs> like them, you know. See, because it's not the outside that counts. It's what's, what, what's in the heart. And, and I like David, by the way. I do like him, even though a lot of his psalms are kind of downers to me, you know. 
I mean, I pour out my complaint, you know, God kill my enemies. I mean, those are heavy things to say. Come on, David, you know, stop it. But when he says, I cry out to the Lord with my voice, my, to, with my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication, he's real. He's saying, this is where my life really is. And when I look at David and I, I see God's testimony, and you know what really matters? It's not man's testimony of you. It's God's testimony. And when you read God's testimony of David in 1 Samuel 13, 14, he says that David is a man after my own heart. That's how God looked at him. He's a man after my own heart. And yet you read the Psalms, and David seems very often to say, Lord, I'm at the end of my rope. I need your help. And that's exactly what he's doing right here. So I really believe it very important that, uh, that we be very real before the Lord. And, and I have to tell you that that's the practice of my life. I have to tell you that. That I'll be in my car sometimes. I'm listening to some music. And I'll just turn the music off. And I just talk to the Lord. And I give him my complaint. And I'll say, this is on my heart, Lord. I'm not hiding this from you. You know my words before they're formed on my tongue. You know my thoughts before they're formed in my mind. You know me from the time I go to bed to the time I get up and everything about me, and all my days are already written in your book. So you know me beyond knowing. And because you do, I'm not going to play with you. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to help me with this because I don't like this about myself. And I want you to help me because, Lord, I don't want to be a phony. I want to be real. And I don't want to preach messages that are so far above how I live that my hypocrisy is going to be exposed. So train me to do those things that are pleasing to you and make me real. And I've been praying that for 34 years. Make me real. So I understand, David, and I think you do too. So he says in verse 2, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path and the way in which I walk. They've secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see. There's no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. So my anxiety has taken my strength from me. I'm exhausted and I'm abandoned. And in the state of sorrow, in the state of depression, God, I call out unto you. In Psalm 61, verse 2, from the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Anybody ever do that? You know, we went through a season of one wave after another, you know, where, our, where my, my life was just smashed to the bottom. I used to body surf a lot when I was a kid. I used to hitchhike to the beach. And when I was 15 years old before I had a car, and we, we did that two or three times a week, every week throughout the summer, we would go body surfing. I loved to body surf. We used to go to Huntington, and we would body surf there. And, and there were times when the waves were big, and you'd go out there, and, and, and it would just smash you. And you know the feeling if you body surf. Man, you hit the ground. When you hit the bottom, and you're just churning underneath there, and you're thinking, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. You know, oh, man, I'm going to die. God, I'll be a good person. Then you come out and say, yeah, all right, I'll catch another wave. You forget what you just prayed, you know. But in, in my spiritual life, you know, uh, for the last few years, there were, it was like there's one major thing that would smash and I would roll and I would feel like my, my, my spiritual air that I wasn't going to ever come up. And then we came back up to the top and we gasped for some spiritual air, if you will. God, you've got to restore me. You've got to heal me, you know. And we, we went through some very heavy things. And I was concerned because when my father went home to be with the Lord for the first year, I was just so overwhelmed by that that every time I came to the pulpit, I was fighting tears, constantly fighting tears. And I would pray. I'd say, Lord, I don't want to bring tears to this pulpit. I don't want the church to go home sad because pastor's sad. And I also know that some cannot come to a church where a man is in grief. And I don't want to give him that, Lord. And yet many of you were with me through all of that. You saw that. And then what happens? Then my father-in-law dies, and then other things, and one wave after another, after another. And that's just life. That's just the way it is. But I understand to some degree what he was talking about when he says, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me. And that can happen to us, but you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they've secretly set a snare for me. Lord, I cry unto you because there doesn't seem to be anybody who cares about me. But, he says in verse 5, I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, they're stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. 
the righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. There are times when you are going through something that's so heavy that you don't even realize that you're isolating yourself. One of the worst things you can do is isolate yourself when you go through pain. I speak from experience. One of the worst things you can do is isolate yourself. My son David, I, I had uh, been through such a tremendous grief because my father was not just my father. He was, he was much more than just a father to me. He was my hero. He was everything. I loved my dad with all of my heart. So, when my dad went home to be with the Lord, I emotionally closed up, and I didn't realize, I did not realize that I honestly didn't. For me, I was in survival mode. I'm going to make it. I was in survival mode. I'm going to make it. I've got a church to pastor. I have things to do. And one day, my son David, you know, this was about a year after losing, uh, well, losing sight of where I was and who I was, my son David said to me, Dad, he said, I lost both my grandfather and my father. And when he said that to me, I looked at him, and I said, what are you talking about? You lost your grandfather and your father? He said, Dad, you disappeared. You disappeared a year ago. And you know how the Scripture says, I was just speaking to you a moment ago, let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness. That was what my son did. He spoke honestly to me. Nobody had told me that. Oh, Marie had tried, but I wouldn't listen to her. <laughs> Seriously, that's the truth. My wife would say, honey, you know, you're, you're isolating. I'd say, uh-huh, yeah, okay, right. You know, sure, honey, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, she was right. But when my David said that, Dad, I lost my grandfather and my father, that was like cold ice water thrown on my soul. It really was. And I looked at him, and I can still remember when he did that about four years ago now. And I looked at him, and I said, that's not true. And he said, Dad, it is. I lost my grandfather and my dad at the same time. And that's what turned me around. That's when I realized, you know what, he's right. There are times when you can feel overwhelmed and you go into this, I'm going to protect myself shell, and you begin to isolate yourself. There's nobody around who understands me. I would even tell my wife, Marie, honey, your daddy's still alive. When your daddy goes home, then you'll understand what I'm dealing with right now. I would tell her that only to see her daddy go home shortly after mine and then her to go through that. And then I took back my words because I realized I wouldn't want her to experience the pain I was suffering and now she was doing the same. You can feel isolated. You can. But you want to know something? When you do what David said, I cried out to the Lord and said, you're my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. That's where my healing came from. When I finally woke up and said, Lord, I have been walking like a zombie. I have been going through the motions and, and all just trying to survive, but Lord, I haven't been victorious. And I haven't been victorious because I took my eyes off of you and I put it just on the step in front of me. And Lord, for that, I am so sorry. Some people in our fellowship, I think, couldn't handle that, and I don't blame them. But after that took place, I began to realize, you know, God is my refuge and my strength. I began to understand what the psalmist meant when he said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. I began to realize the lessons of Scripture, and that's how come the psalm, Psalm 103, 7, became so dear to me. He showed his, his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. That's when the Lord began to reveal his ways, not just his actions. And that comes because you finally realize you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. If I don't have you, I don't have anything, Lord. So I need you first in my life. I need you first. 